Hello and welcome to another episode of Physical Attraction. So last episode I kind of said that I wouldn't do anything else about the coronavirus and that was really a lie. I'm sorry, I can't really help myself at this point. Again, all the previous disclaimers apply, you don't have to listen to it. This is just my way of organising my thoughts and I'll try and get some non-pandemic content out as well. So you can think of this as a bonus if you like. First off, I hope you're all doing really well. This show serves very little purpose in the grand scheme of things, aside from mid-pandemic therapy for me, but if it makes people feel slightly less alone, that's quite important. I hope you're all doing well and concentrating on getting used to things and taking care of the people around you. Secondly, I want to draw your attention to a couple of pandemic public service announcements. Firstly, there have been increasing anecdotal reports that one of the earlier symptoms of coronavirus is losing a sense of taste and smell. I imagine this is the kind of thing that drives hypochondriacs like me wild, but it's worth noting it, as it has been widely reported that it might be a sign that arises even in mild cases. It's nowhere near enough to diagnose you, because this is pretty common with colds as well, but it might be evidence makes this a more robust conclusion over time. And this is from Professor Nirmal Kumar and Professor Claire Hopkins of ENT UK, who noted that as many as 40% of patients tested in South Korea had this as a symptom. So it's worth bearing in mind, if you've had a sudden loss of a sense of smell, it might be worth isolating yourself for a week or seeing what else develops. Second announcement, of course, is social distancing. Now, I think this is extremely important. We all know you've probably seen this already, but because of exponential growth in the early phase, it's very simple. Um, if a sick person infects 2.5 people on average, six generations of infection around a month down the line, that would be 244 people. If you see half as many people, which gets that reproduction number, that R0, the number of people you infect, down to 1.25, then that decreases to four people infected by the end of that month. And if you see 40% or fewer as many people as you normally do, then R0 is less than one and the epidemic will actually be shrinking. And this is simply 2.5 to the power of six versus 1.25 to the power of six, assuming that you know this thing doubles every five days or so, um, or transmits to a new generation every five days or so. And that you, you can go from 244 people to four if you halve your contacts or less. The BBC is actually circulating here in the UK a version of this factoid demonstrating exponential growth, but I think their numbers are slightly wrong. Uh, there are two versions of the original infographic floating around, and this is the one that I got when I did the basic maths myself. So one set of us is wrong. Not that it really matters, because their graphic says 400 people, 244 people is hardly any better than that. Um, you could be sim asymptomatic and not know that you're sick, so we have to obey these rules as much as we can, the social distancing rules, it's very important. And, by the way, if anyone knows why their number is different from this one, uh, and I've made some stupid mathematical mistake, which can easily happen, then let me know, because I'm quite interested to see how there it is that there are these two graphics floating around, and the one that seems to be in the mainstream is the one that doesn't make as much sense to me. So another PSA, and a crucial one. In the UK, there's now a central government effort for volunteers to help in the pandemic. You can sign up for it at goodsamapp.org slash NHS. You'll need ID like a passport or driving licence, and you can do tasks as a volunteer, including phoning up isolated people to check on them, driving groceries to isolated people, or taking people to and from hospital appointments. You can choose how much you want to do and which of these you want to do if you're less comfortable with some of them. But uh, they're looking for young and healthy people to help out. And we know that not just this virus, but also the measures we're taking to contain it will have disproportionate impacts on the most vulnerable people in society. So making sure that those measures are successful, that's going to help us too, because it will save lives and reduce the length of time we all need to be disrupted for. So it's an extremely constructive thing to do with your time. And for your own mental health, doing things that feel positive and helping out rather than watching endless streams of horror and breaking news is going to be quite important, I think. Now, for the majority of you listening, you're not in the UK, but there is probably going to be similar things in your own country. Even if it's not centrally organised by the government, mutual aid organisations are showing up all over the country here and hopefully all over the world, and uh, sign up if you can. And of course, even if there's no formal structure, uh, we all know how to look after our communities and uh, you know, go around the neighbours and post notes saying that you can help and all this sort of thing. And it, it, it's going to be really helpful to make this quarantine effort a success, because I think it's going to be very difficult to pull this off in uh, in various countries across the world and anything we can do to assist in that is going to be very valuable. So onto the show proper then. I want to start out with a little toy mathematical exercise that is really useful because it lets us compare different countries in an unbiased way, uh, it lets us get some insight into how successful they are at testing new cases and it lets us figure out how advanced the epidemic is. And it also emphasises just how important it is to keep up with the social distancing and everything we can do to stop exponential growth of this pandemic in the early phases. 
Then I'm going to go on to talk about a recent paper from Oxford University which has got a lot of press and why I think that a lot of that press is now basically misinformation and uh, the importance of scientific literacy uh, in this uh, fast-moving situation and um, various examples of that. And I'm going to talk about uh, in, a, in a future episode potential implications for society from the Imperial College modelling paper. So there's a few scientific papers that we're going to cover in some depth here. So there's a useful rule of thumb that the chief scientific advisor has been using to estimate the number of cases of coronavirus that are currently in the UK. And this is that one death in the hospital reported means that there are around a thousand cases. I want to explain how this works and why it's useful. First off, measuring deaths is easier than measuring cases because the only way to be sure of cases, especially when a lot of them are mild or asymptomatic, is testing everyone. And most likely in your country, you know now that there's lots of people who are sick who can't get tested because there's a bottleneck in the testing in terms of getting someone to come to you with a swab and swab you, take the swab to the lab, etc, etc. So even in countries where testing is pretty good, there will be lots of cases that aren't being detected. So the deaths, though, are being measured pretty well because they are in hospitals and uh, in most cases the severely ill people are still being tested. So I want to explain how this works, because as grim as it is to contemplate, it actually emphasises two of the principles of thinking about this epidemic that I outlined in the last episode. The fact that we're seeing things on a delay, and the fact that we have this exponential growth in the early phase. So it really brings home the importance of mitigation measures. So the current estimate is that around 1% of people who get this disease go on to die, providing they can get decent healthcare, which is what you'd expect uh, from the early stages of the pandemic. Now this comes from the Diamond Princess cruise ship and from reanalysis of data from Wuhan and also expats from Wuhan who went to other countries and were tested. Um, you can actually follow through cases where you've tested and isolated a whole population from the Diamond Princess or a whole population from these expatriates and that gives you a more accurate uh, examination of what the mortality rate is compared to looking at hospitals where you only see the most severe cases. So if one person dies that means that there were at least 100 cases. Uh, because of the 1% death rate. But it takes people time to get sick, and then unfortunately to worsen and pass away. It takes five-ish days on average from exposure to symptoms, and two to three weeks for people to decline and unfortunately die if they do go on to die. Now, we also know that if nothing is being done to stop the spread, the disease grows roughly exponentially as people get infected, which means it doubles over a certain period of time. Now, it's hard to say exactly what this doubling time is, but maybe it's every five to seven days at first into a population with no immunity. So if we see one death, that tells us that three weeks ago there were 100 cases, 1% of which have ultimately now gone on to die. But we also know that those other cases, those other 99, have been multiplying due to this exponential growth, doubling maybe three or four times in those three or four weeks it took for this one person to go from being infected to unfortunately passing away. And by the time you see the death, the 100 cases then have doubled three or four times and you have 800 to 1000 cases. So as long as nothing is done to curb the spread, a very rough estimate is that cases now are a thousand times the number of deaths. So this means that there are probably um, around 100,000, 200,000 cases in the UK at the moment, and you can infer the same thing for your country. And this gives you a real idea for why this disease was probably always going to be impossible to contain despite the best efforts of everyone involved. The first major red flag that something is wrong might well be when someone dies at the hospital of this new disease, and by then, by the moment that happens, you already have a thousand cases somewhere and growing fast. A final chilling thought on this, because as we say, each death means you see around a thousand cases must exist now. With a 1% death rate, each death that we see now means that there are around 10 more coming down the pipe in the next two to three weeks. So if nothing is done to stop the spread, and it's growing exponentially, this is the reality. So we have to do everything we can to slow down and stop that spread so that this uh, toy mathematical model no longer works and we don't have 10 deaths coming down the pipe for every death we see. So this mathematical exercise is horrible and is awful and I kind of hate talking about human life in this very abstract way and I hate thinking about it, but it's real and we have to confront what this means and we have to do everything we can to stop the spread of this disease. And luckily here in my country, I think we're now finally taking this seriously. We have a total remain indoors style lockdown for everyone announced on Monday night earlier this week. And uh, the key thing here, if we're going to stop this, is going to be understanding these principles of the epidemic, initial exponential growth, delayed unfolding of the pandemic, and only the most serious cases being documented. So in brief, we see the pandemic unfolding in a delayed way because of the disease incubation time, the time symptoms take to get serious, the time it takes to test, and the time it takes to die. 
We see it initially growing exponentially because no one is immune, which means you would expect cases to grow quite rapidly from hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands if nothing is done to stop it. And we also only see the worst of the pandemic largely in terms of how severe the disease is through the lens of hospitals where people with severe disease end up. This delaying factor, by the way, is absolutely crucial to understand what we should expect to happen next. I'm sure most people know this, but it's crucial to remember. The effects of the lockdown are delayed by two or three weeks or even a month. So the people that will sadly die over the next few weeks are already ill now. The measures we take can't help stop them from being infected. So for the first few weeks, it's going to look like the situation is only getting worse. You have to watch Italy to see how effective their lockdown is. And I'm seeing reported in the news people saying that, oh, despite the lockdown, Italy is still struggling with this. Well, no, it's only a couple of weeks since they started, so you would only expect it to start making a difference now. And indeed, in the last two or three days, we have seen the daily death rate from Italy go down. And we know from China that their lockdown was effective at preventing uh, a, a massive epidemic that would have caused many more deaths. So it's premature to say we know what our measures have done. And we're always going to be flying this a little bit blind because we're not going to know the impact of our measures until a few weeks after they've been taken. Now, the other thing that this rough rule of thumb, this one death equals a thousand cases allows you to do, is understand how badly or well countries are doing in testing people with coronavirus. Now, obviously there's gonna be a lot of noise here. What if the first few hundred people that were infected were all in an at-risk group and you got unlucky? Then the death rate would be higher than 1% and the thousand rule doesn't work. But we're going to assume that it's approximately true for most countries and then infer what that might mean. So I want to emphasize that when it comes to understanding the progress of this disease in different countries and the real fatality rate, looking at the numbers from different countries and naively dividing them together basically tells you nothing unless you do a more detailed mathematical analysis. So for example, looking at the Worldometer's trackers, when I wrote this, there were 422 deaths and 8,000 cases in the UK, which would imply a 5% death rate if you just divide those numbers. Germany has 32,000 cases and 156 deaths, which dividing them gives you 0.5%. So is the healthcare 10 times better in Germany than Britain? Are the people 10 times healthier? No, not at all. For a start, these aren't true death rates. Some people haven't died yet, so the top of the fraction is wrong. And they aren't true case rates because those are limited by detection and testing, so the bottom of the fraction is also wrong. Based on the very rough one in a thousand rule, Germany probably has 150,000 cases and has detected around 20% of them. The UK probably has about 420,000 cases and has detected a much smaller fraction of them, around 2%. And when we look at the testing, what do we find? Germany can test 12,000 people a day. In the UK, until recently, it was 1,000 and has ramped up to 6,000 only in the last few days. So Germany is testing more, they're finding more cases, and therefore the death rate is closer to what it really is. It's looking lower. Uh, combine this with the fact that Germany doesn't test post-mortem cases routinely, and you can see that what initially appears to be this tenfold discrepancy in how severe the illness is, is actually pretty explicable. It's not that the disease is much more fatal in some places than others, although we would certainly expect some differences due to better healthcare, underlying differences in the population, or just statistical luck. But um, it's important to say there's a limit to how much we can learn from just dividing these numbers, and it's really something we have to leave to the expert epidemiologists to work out. And they have been working on it. There's a couple of individual reports that I'm going to discuss over the next few episodes, uh, bearing in mind that I'm not an expert. But first, a quick warning. I mean, you have to be careful about even scientific literature in cases like this for several reasons. First off, it's a fast-moving situation. There's immense pressure to publish results on the coronavirus, because if you're right, it can make your name as a scientist and get you a whole bunch of citations. You know, I wish things weren't motivated that way, but unfortunately, that's the world that we live in. Um, and these will be the motivations for some people. And equally, there are very good and noble motivations too. Some people, for example, those who have seen a new experimental drug appearing to be effective in some cases, they're going to want to share that information that could save lives, and they'll argue that there's no time for the usual thorough vetting and peer review when this information could help people. This can lead to inaccurate information being spread around, and everything's being done so quickly that mistakes are going to be made. And secondly, some of the papers that we're all poring over are not actually published and peer reviewed, they're preprints. Now, anyone can upload a preprint to the internet. It's not undergone the rigorous review that a scientific paper has done. It's a way of getting all that information out there earlier than a peer review process allows you to do. And generally, you can publish them pretty quickly without too much scrutiny. This doesn't mean that all preprints are junk, but you have to take them with an additional grain of salt. And thirdly, finally, scientists disagree all the time, especially on an issue like this. There is not going to be 100% consensus. And perhaps the most important factor here, scientific papers can easily be misinterpreted by people who write popular science people who write clickbait, 
and people who churn that clickbait into more articles. Now, you have to understand that. So I'm going to illustrate to you how that process might work. So here's one example. The virus that caused SARS in 2002-3-4, that, that is a similar coronavirus to the one we're dealing with. Now, it turns out that severe SARS patients had inflammation of the testicles. So a paper published 10 years ago suggested that, you know, we should study these patients and see if SARS had any impact on their fertility. Now, we also know that there's a special protein on the walls of our cells called ACE2. It's an enzyme that helps to regulate our blood pressure. Now, this protein can serve as the entry point to cells in the lungs and heart for the novel coronavirus. Uh, it's the protein that um, they can use to enter the cell and replicate themselves. And this was also true of SARS. It also bound to these ACE2 receptors. And it's also true that there are lots of ACE2 proteins in the testicles. And we also know that a significant fraction of the people who've died so far have had hypertension, high blood pressure. ACE2 lowers your blood pressure. And in a recent study, 63% of those admitted to intensive care in the UK were overweight, while only one was underweight. Those are all scientific facts. Those are all accurate. Those are all sourced to peer-reviewed scientific literature. Now, if you're an unscrupulous headline writer, you can turn that straight into, well, the new coronavirus might make men infertile, and if you have high blood pressure, your body is making huge amounts of ACE2 that will mean it's likely to kill you. Being overweight is deadly, and being underweight saves you. I mean... All of that will look like it's supported by the scientific literature. And those statements aren't entirely false. We're not talking drinking alcohol kills the coronavirus, another myth that has unfortunately claimed lives so far. In all these cases, we have a plausible sounding mechanism to explain what's going on. But they're certainly not supported by all of the evidence. Most infections of coronavirus don't reach people's testicles, and it's milder than SARS. And we don't know, even know whether the SARS patients were infertile or not after their infection. So... Yes, there's a mechanism for how that might happen. Yes, it's something worth looking at as a potential uh, long-term consequence of infection. But there's really no evidence that it actually happens at all. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of viruses that cause things like the common cold that bind to ACE2 receptors that won't necessarily be the case that um, they can cause these things. It's, it's purely theoretical, and it would rely on a substantial overwhelming of the body's ordinary immune system. I mean, people with high blood pressure... Is it the case that ACE2 is making them more vulnerable? Well, maybe, but also they're likely to be unhealthy in other ways, maybe elderly, and we simply don't have the comparisons to show that, all else being equal, high blood pressure is a major, major risk factor. It is associated with an unhealthy lifestyle, so that's not going to help your immune system all that much. And as for the weight categories, well, I told you that 63% of those admitted to intensive care in the UK were overweight. It sort of sounds like overweight is a, is a bad thing to be uh, when it comes specifically to this virus and your chances. But 62% um, of Britain uh, is classified as overweight by the flawed BMI system, including myself, uh, just about. Um, just 2% are underweight. So actually, those figures are pretty much exactly what you'd expect from a random sample of the population if your weight had basically no impact on whether you were admitted to intensive care. So you can see how easy it is to quote statistics out of context, to misinterpret information that does have a source, and... It makes sense. Look, I'm not a doctor. I have zero medical training at all. But in my field, climate science, I'm learning to recognise the difference between good and bad papers. But if I'd never studied it and instead just took random statistics out of context, I know that I could draw conclusions about almost anything. And sadly, you know, and sadly, you know, a lot of smart people are going to be fooled by this because people will say, what's your source for that? And they'll link to a scientific paper and they won't necessarily understand the scientific paper because, you know, they're not medical experts. I don't fully understand these papers. It, it takes me a long time to understand each of these cases and sort out the information from the misinformation. And I'm sure that I have been falling for stuff that's not true as well. I, I try and vet it as much as possible, but there's a reason that experts are experts. It's because they have an eye for what is likely to be uh, a genuine concern and what's more like, oh, that's interesting. Um, maybe that could happen. But actually, when you think about it, it's really quite unlikely. And unfortunately, we've seen a pretty tragic consequence of this rush to publish information and get this stuff out there already. I mean, one of the antiviral drugs that we discussed last week that is currently being tested for effectiveness against coronavirus is a drug called chloroquine, which is usually used to treat malaria. Now, the paper's sample size was just 40 patients, and I saw a pretty damning critique on how they gathered their data online, um, that this wasn't a particularly great study. But um, despite this, President Trump, who appears to have already tired of the whole pandemic, touted as, as a cure from his Twitter feed against official medical advice. Uh, 
Now the same chemical, chloroquine, in a different formulation is used in aquariums to clean fish tanks. And in a similar way that many Americans rely on antibiotics meant for fish, rather than paying health insurance prices for them, two Americans ended up taking some of the aquarium chloroquine after Trump said it was a cure for coronavirus. One of them is now dead, and the other was rushed to hospital. So, I'm, I'm just saying, you have to be very careful when it comes to sources of information, uh, who you trust, who you understand, um, to what extent you've interrogated these headline figures, and how reliable they might be. Because a lot of people are, unfortunately, incentivized to do the wrong thing, and share inaccurate information, whether it's because they want clicks on their article, whether it's because they want profits for their drug company, whether it's because they genuinely believe something, um, or want to believe something, that, that turns out not actually to be true or supported. Um, so I think it's it's really crucial now that we you know realise that there's a reason for being conservative in science about what we can say. And when I say conservative, I mean you need a lot of evidence to say something conclusively, because otherwise misinformation like this can just spread like wildfire, and there can be bad consequences. So with all that out of the way, let's talk about this Oxford paper that I mentioned. Um, it's from some researchers at Oxford, and it's called Fundamental Principles of Epidemic Spread Highlight the Immediate Need for Large-Scale Serological Surveys to Assess the Stage of the SARS-CoV-2 Epidemic. And you can get that online. Um, there's a draft that I think just comes up on Google if you search for it. Now essentially what the modelers do here is they run a pretty standard epidemiology model which accounts for the people who are susceptible, infectious, recovered, and hence immune, and deceased. Now what they find is interesting but it rests on a key assumption. You assume that a small percentage of the population can potentially become severely ill due to the coronavirus. So let's say you assume that it's a 1% of the population uh, can become severely ill due to coronavirus and the basic reproduction number, the number of people who get infected on average, is about 2.2 which is what we expect from existing literature. Then you can find out that you get a pretty good fit to the data in the UK for cases and deaths so far if you assume that the first case in the UK arose shortly after the first confirmed case, i.e. when we first detected someone there was actually someone else we didn't detect and community spread started about that time. Then, by the time the first death is reported around the 5th of March, Around 1% of the country is actually already sick with the coronavirus, and by the end of last week, 19th of March, according to this simple model, as many as 30% of the country could have been exposed to the coronavirus already. Now this would all fit with the observed deaths and our estimated rate of transmission. On the other hand, if you assume that the fraction of the population who got severely ill is 0.1%, then the model suggests that community spread began a week before the first case was detected in the UK, and as many as 60% of the country has already gotten sick. So what's the point of all this, uh, making these assumptions and plugging them into this model and seeing what you get? The point here is that, we talked about it in the last episode, we don't know exactly how severe this is yet. It's plausible that transmission started a week before we detected a case or around the same time. Yet what we can see from this model is that a disease that is milder but started spreading only a bit earlier or spread slightly more quickly looks the same as a more severe disease which started spreading more slowly. All the hospitals see are the sickest people with no way of knowing if that's an unlucky 0.1% of millions of people who mostly had a mild illness or didn't even know they were sick, or if that is uh, still unlucky, but uh, about 5% of a much smaller sample of thousands of people who are sick. Both scenarios are somewhat plausible. And there's an inverse relationship here. If the disease is bad in a big fraction of people, then fewer of us might have had it otherwise we'd see more people at the hospitals. If the disease is asymptomatic or mild in most people, then perhaps many more of us have had it. We don't know, because both situations would cause hospitals to see the same number of admissions and deaths, and we know that testing is limited. And this explains the title of the paper, which emphasises how crucial the antibody test is. This is serology, the test that examines your blood and determines if you've produced anti-coronavirus antibodies if you've ever been infected and now have some defence against the virus. This test has now been developed. Um, there was a paper describing it a few days ago. Apparently the UK has ordered three and a half million of them and they'll be on the way in weeks, whatever that means, and your country is probably getting a hold of them too. But it's going to be really crucial to do this, especially in Wuhan. And this is not just because it allows people, and particularly frontline healthcare workers, to know if they're immune to the disease. It also gives us a much better understanding of how severe the disease is for most people and what hospitals should expect in terms of cases. 
Because of this relationship, measuring how many people have already got sick tells us how severe the disease is. So if we find that 60% of the UK, or Wuhan, already had coronavirus, then obviously the severe cases are a tiny fraction of the overall cases. But if we find out that most people haven't had it, as we expect at the moment, then we know that the asymptomatic cases are rarer and unfortunately severe cases are more common. So that's the point of the paper. We need this antibody test to rule out a scenario of a mild disease that is spreading really quickly, which would look like a severe disease which is spreading more slowly. Is it likely that we're seeing a mild disease that is spreading rapidly? It's certainly possible, and you need the antibody test done on a big sample of the population to rule it out. But I don't think, unfortunately, it is likely. The Diamond Princess cruise ship, where everyone was tested, saw 7 deaths and 35 cases in critical condition at one time or another, out of 700 cases. So if only 0.1% of people got severely ill, that's the scenario where half the country has already had coronavirus, explaining how 5% got severely ill on the Diamond Princess would be rather challenging, unless it was due to some different strain of the virus that was more deadly. I mean, they're not that much older on the Diamond Princess. People have done studies where they have translated the age demographic of the Diamond Princess to a country like the UK and concluded the death rate would be about 1%, maybe higher. Uh, not, not that the severe illness rate, the hospitalisation rate, would only be 0.1%. And in fact, if you read the paper, the 0.1% severely ill number is basically just plucked out of the air as an example illustrating how a mild disease could resemble this disease if it spreads more quickly. We know that hospitals are biased to the worst cases, um, but it might be hard to reconcile that data with evidence from the ground in Italy and things like perfectly ordinary people in their 30s and 40s with no underlying health conditions ending up in intensive care. It's hard for me to square that with a virus that is overwhelmingly mild or asymptomatic. And there are other cases too where we have big samples which don't suggest that this 0.1% is actually the case. So Iceland, for example, did a massive test. They tested 1% of their population, and they estimated from that that 1% of the whole population of Iceland is probably infected with the virus. So that's not 60% being infected. Um, and it also doesn't match the data from a small village in Italy which tested its entire residents. They found that around 3% had the virus, and half of those had no or mild symptoms. So the point is here that we're not talking about 99.9% .9 of cases being undetected. It might actually be closer to half. So this 0.1% figure for severe cases and the 50% already infected figure, um, they're possible, but they don't really line up with the admittedly small-scale data we've seen so far, which suggests otherwise. So to summarise, we now have this serology test. Singapore has already used it uh, for a few clinical studies and tracing of contacts of sick people and so on. I'm hoping in a few weeks we'll have thousands of people uh, tested with these blood samples somewhere in the world, and then we'll have a better idea of how severe the disease is, which is going to be related to how many people are already sick or have been sickened already. And this study is very validly pointing out that there are gaps in our knowledge, and this number of what fraction of people need to go to the hospital is crucial. If the number of people who need serious medical care is 5%, which is our working assumption, the epidemic is unmanageable and needs to be suppressed. If it's 0.1%, which is just about feasible within the realms of possibility, if you assume that the, the case studies that we've done are unusual and you can tweak some parameters in your model, then maybe millions of people have already recovered from the coronavirus. What's the betting that eventually the real number of people who need serious medical care will be somewhere between 0.1 and 5%? I'll take good odds on that, I really will. But either way, that number is crucial to what we can expect from this pandemic, and it's going to be important to get it when we can do the antibody test. So that's great, that's good research, as long as no one misinterprets the paper massively by just reading one statistic out of it. Wait, whoops, the Financial Times has a headline saying 50% of people may have coronavirus in the UK, and the article goes on to suggest that this is in some way an update to the Imperial College modelling the government is using, which we'll talk about in another episode. And I spoke to my mum just now, and even she's heard of this misleading figure quoted out of context from this study, and it seems to have got all the way around the world. Maybe millions of people believe it without knowing necessarily what the paper was talking about, and it might undermine the quarantine effort that is already difficult. So it's just another example of something that's probably causing more confusion than enlightenment. I mean, I want to emphasise here that 
I'd be the happiest person in the world if it turns out this pandemic is a lot less deadly than we currently fear it might be. But you can't rely on assumptions like that turning out to be true without evidence, when they even don't seem to line up with the evidence that much. When lives are on the line, we have to err on the side of extreme caution. We don't know what an uncontrolled epidemic of coronavirus would look like, because Wuhan and Italy and now the rest of Europe and India are going into lockdown to avoid finding out what would happen there. I mean, safest and best by far to lock down to prevent any more spread of the disease from happening. And then we want to deploy this antibody test really quickly to eliminate this source of uncertainty. And who knows, maybe it will turn out that the epidemic is practically finished already. Then we can have a massive party, but sadly, and I wish it wasn't so, I highly, highly doubt that this is the case. I want to finish on a sad note, but a note that might prove ultimately to be a little bit inspiring. I was reading the other day about the story of Dr. Carlo Urbani. He was the doctor who first identified SARS as a new, highly contagious illness in 2003. Triggering a robust response to that outbreak, who knows how many lives he saved. But not his own. He died of SARS in March 2003, aged just 46. SARS never became a pandemic, but warnings persisted for years that it, or a related novel coronavirus, could someday, and that we were not prepared. SARS in 2003 was a coronavirus that crossed from animals to people, MERS in 2011, a coronavirus that crossed from animals to people. Every nine or so years, a coronavirus crosses from animals into humans, and there was nothing to suggest that the next one might not cause a devastating pandemic. And yet people didn't take the threat seriously, they didn't do enough to act on the warnings or prepare for them, and here we are trying to implement 15 billion tonnes of cure when a few grams of prevention might have done just as well. And this crisis has already created its own heroes with their own warnings who have also died. Why is it that we can never seem to learn the lessons of history? Is it really human nature that we can only learn through bitter, hard, painful experience? Or is it the flaws inherent in the systems that we've built and the priorities that they have? My old physics tutor said once that each mistake leaves a mental scar and this is how you learn. We used to joke about that, it was a justification for how hard the problems were, but... Uh, of course the world is massively better if we can be smart and have foresight and act early and prepare and head things off at the pass. And when we do this, we would never know the worlds of catastrophe that we averted with our actions. I think back to the Teotihuacan specials, Stanislav Petrov, that man that few people have even heard of, who through his actions averted a nuclear war. Can you imagine the world after a thermonuclear conflict and how disrupted that would be compared to what's happening now? And yet, when you avert a catastrophe, you never know the world that you averted. Well, now, sadly, we're living in a world that looks pretty catastrophic. But like all crises, it can be a catalyst for change, positive change, good change. Change is not going to be easy, and it doesn't come automatically just because something destructive has happened. That's naive, millennialist thinking in the religious sense of the word, and I'll, I'll put up our episode that we did about that. But we can build a better world. To stop things like this from happening again, we have to. I'm going to leave you with a song by Melody Sheep, who did the soundtrack and the theme song for our normal episodes. I always find their music very nice to listen to, and I hope that you enjoy it as well. Mm. 